is April 10th, 2003. F-16 fighters scream to life on a nearby tarmac, while C-130 cargo planes are loaded up with supplies. A handful of soldiers play cards on a makeshift table, trying to distract themselves from the anxiety in the air. They are American, British, Australian, and Polish. All are exhausted by the long approach to the capital, but they know that the fighting is not over yet. As another plane departs for Baghdad, the Australian announces Royal Flush and lays down his cards. The others groan. He's won. But this is no ordinary game of poker. On each card, the face of a high-ranking Iraqi official is printed. They include generals, ministers, and, on the ace of spades, the president himself, Saddam Hussein. It is useful for the soldiers to familiarize themselves with these men. Soon enough, they'll be hunting them. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly talk about today's sponsor, Blinkist. A common dilemma our researchers face is an overload of information. Although it's never been easier to acquire it, the sheer amount of data available on the internet often makes it hard to gather the key points needed for an accurate depiction of events. But fortunately, Blinkist provides an excellent solution by providing condensed but accurate summaries of over 3,000 books by notable authors. With over 14 million active users, Blinkist strives to make learning as easy as possible, taking complex works and boiling them down to just 15 minutes of essential information, consumable through text or audio formats. Recently, I listened to Chernobyl by Ukrainian-American Harvard professor of history, Seri Plaki. This blink encapsulates the perfect storm of incompetent engineering, bureaucracy, poor management, and negligence from authorities that led to a disaster capable of dissolving the USSR, and it only took 15 minutes. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash the armchair historian will get a free seven day trial that they can cancel at any time, followed by a 25% discount on full membership if they choose to stick with the service. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. Today, we will be covering the 2003 invasion of Iraq, sometimes referred to as the second Gulf War which saw hundreds of thousands of troops committed to an invasion that ended with the deposition of a dictator. While we will cover some of the political background and context of this much-discussed conflict, this video will primarily focus on the combat, maneuvers, and objectives of the momentous invasion that sparked an eight-year occupation and insurgency. But first, if you haven't had the chance to check out our video on the first Iraq war, here is a quick recap. After it ended with Iraqi forces being expelled from Kuwait, the US soldiers sought to protect Kurdish and Shiite minorities in Iraq by enforcing no-fly zones and launching airstrikes against strategic sites such as oil fields and military bases. But following Saddam Hussein's repeated refusal to cooperate with UN weapon inspectors, the United States passed the Iraqi Liberation Act, which officially solidified the goal of regime change in the country. At the time, though, this act simply consisted of providing millions of dollars to numerous opposition groups in the country, with the hope of toppling Saddam's government. In late 2002, the United States began building a case against the Ba'athist government of Iraq and sought the support of the UN Security Council. On top of the claimed ties to Al-Qaeda, the Bush administration had a laundry list of justifications for armed intervention, including the mistreatment of civilians and the aforementioned expulsion of UN weapons inspectors. Perhaps foreseeing how controversial these accusations would be in the future, many in the UN Security Council strenuously objected to the proposed invasion, insisting that America pursue a diplomatic solution instead. But even while the Council debated, CIA teams were landing in Iraq to lay the groundwork for a full-scale invasion. The US had already made up its mind. Saddam's regime was doomed. 
Moving quickly, members of the Special Activities Division established contact with the Kurdish Peshmergas who opposed Saddam. Then, they began identifying key elements of Iraqi leadership. This intelligence would be used to devastating effect in the opening days of the conflict, with surgical airstrikes killing many high-ranking officers. Additionally, the Special Activities Division captured a chemical weapons factory, yet despite Secretary of State Colin Powell's vivid descriptions of mobile weapons laboratories on the backs of trucks and train cars, the facility was the only one of its kind found during the entire Iraq War. Unsurprisingly, these preemptive strikes did not help America's case to the UN, which continued to call for de-escalation. Key NATO members, such as France and Canada, were also highly vocal in condemning America's aggression. Opposition around the world mounted, culminating with the largest recorded protest in human history when on February 15, 2003, over 6 million people in 800 cities gathered to protest the war. Nevertheless, in March of 2003, the United States and the Coalition of the Willing, which included the United Kingdom, Poland, and Australia, among others, began massing troops in the region. Unlike the war fought 12 years earlier, they would be advancing without UN approval. The invasion began slowly. The first phase consisted of numerous airstrikes and covert raids on targets within the country, with varying degrees of success. One of the first of these was the Battle of al Qaim on March 17th, when units of the British Special Air Service attacked a suspected chemical weapons site housed in a water treatment facility near the Syrian border. But the Iraqi defenders put up an unexpectedly spirited defense, and the commando team was forced to withdraw under heavy fire. Frustrated, they called in an airstrike leveling the entire facility and obliterating any potential evidence that chemical weapons were being held in the facility. Another strike occurred two days later, at a community just outside Baghdad called Dura Farms. Believing that Saddam was visiting his sons in the area, the United States saturated the area with 8,000 pounds of ordnance and 40 Tomahawk cruise missiles in an attempt to wipe the Iraqi dictator off the face of the earth. However, every single satellite-guided warhead missed its target, and as a result, over a dozen civilians were injured and one killed. To complete the debacle, it was later discovered that Saddam's last visit to the area had been nearly a decade ago. Despite these issues, the main invasion was finally getting underway. Based on the precedent set in the first Gulf War and Afghanistan, most observers had expected a lengthy period of aerial bombardment before any ground offensive. However, the coalition instead opted to launch a rapid air and ground campaign that would avoid most urban areas and focus on decapitating the Iraqi government. This tactic, later called shock and awe, was chosen for two reasons. First, American leaders assumed that if the command structure was eliminated, organized resistance would disintegrate. Second, it was hoped that the civilian population would support the Americans as liberators. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was particularly optimistic about this, stating, there will be Iraqis who offer not only to help us, but to help liberate the country and free the Iraqi people. As we will see, this wasn't totally the case. On the night of March 19th, members of the 160th Airborne, known as the Night Stalkers, destroyed more than 70 Iraqi military outposts along the southern and western borders. With the path cleared, coalition forces advanced from Kuwait in two prongs, one directed north and one south. A combined air and amphibious assault was also launched on the Al Fal Peninsula on March 20th with the goal of securing the critical oil infrastructure located there. American, British, and Polish commandos all worked tirelessly to capture the offshore platforms before they could be sabotaged by the defenders. Despite significant resistance from entrenched Iraqis supported by artillery fire, the teams were able to secure the peninsula after a grueling three-day battle. Their efforts likely prevented a major ecological disaster and saved billions of dollars worth of equipment that Saddam would otherwise have destroyed in a petty act of revenge. Unfortunately for the coalition, this would be the last bit of good PR they would receive for quite some time. As we'll see in the part two, which is out right now, 
The war for Iraq was just beginning, and even this initial taste of victory had been soured by the clumsy handling of Al Qaim and the disaster at Dura Farms. While coalition casualties remained minimal, intelligence failures would continue to plague future operations, muddying the overall picture of the war in Iraq to such an extent that many details remain unclear to this day. Thanks to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Click their link in the description to support the channel. And don't forget to continue to the part two in the description below.